All right, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. We are live here on YouTube. Welcome to Delegate Bagnell's Virtual Town Hall. We're just letting all of our guests in. We're gonna take a moment here just to let all our guests join us. And of course, welcome to uh, those guests who are joining us live on the YouTube stream. Thank you for being here. We super appreciate uh, your, uh, your attendance here at Delegate Bagnell's Virtual Town Hall. Tonight, we'll be talking about the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, and uh, the effects that it has had on our long-term care facilities and, um, and assisted living and so on. We have a fabulous uh, panel of experts to, uh, to introduce and Delegate Bagnell will do that uh, very shortly. Uh, in the first place, uh, just let me uh, give you a couple of housekeeping points. Uh, all of the guests will remain muted uh, throughout the meeting. If you do have a question, please feel free to place it in the chat and we will try to get to all the questions. Um, there may be a, a large number and so we'll get to them, as many of them as we can. If we can't get to them during the town hall this evening, uh, please do email uh, the delegates office and we'll place the email address in the chat also uh, if you would like to follow up on any of the topics that are covered and also if you have any other thoughts or comments about future town halls uh, other than that um, uh, i will pass over the proceedings to delegate back now Good evening and thank you for joining us today for the sixth of our 2021 legislative session virtual town hall series I'm Heather Bagnell, your delegate in District 33. As many of you know, this is crossover week. And, uh, and though um, I was worried that we would still be on the floor, I am excited to say that, that uh, not only will I be here, but um, that Delegate Lehman will be able to join us. So I wanna thank you all for your continued commitment to staying safe by practicing physical distancing and safe protocols and for your patience as we work to get the vaccine to, uh, to all of our communities. We are now in the final week of the 2021 session. And the Maryland General Assembly is working diligently on final passage of a number of priority bills having passed the most effective budget in 100 years to not only put Maryland on the path to recovery, but to lift Maryland families out of poverty and ensure the future of our Maryland children. I continue to champion the issue of access to mental health services as well as other, as, as well as is expanding telehealth and ensuring timely reimbursement for providers who are already both financially vulnerable and oversubscribed due to the pandemic. I mention this as a segue to tonight's town hall discussion. As we know, our aging population was immediately and consequentially impacted by the COVID outbreak. And long-term care facilities, nursing homes, assisted living facilities scrambled not only to try and mitigate the damage, but to control the spread, all while receiving conflicting information as the science changed without adequate available supply of PPE and test kits at the front, and while federal aid was still being debated, we have learned a great deal about how to address such a, a far reaching public health crisis, about the impact of isolation and about the need for assistance in assisting our most vulnerable populations. Tonight, we will be talking about what went right and wrong, how we have adapted and, how, and what we've learned and strategies not only to ensure the stability of the industry, but the challenges and strategies to make aging in place or aging in care accessible. I am honored to be joined tonight by Delegate Mary Lehman from District 21 and the sponsor of HB 983, COVID-19 and other catastrophic health emergencies visitation, the Gloria Dates Lewis Act, which was named for the mother of Delegate Karen Lewis Young, who also championed this issue. Carissa Guin, the director of the Anne Arundel County Department of Aging and Disabilities, Tracy Laval, the Senior Vice President of Quality and Health Improvement with the Maryland Hospital Association, and Joseph DeMatos, the President and CEO of Health Facilities Association of Maryland. I also want to acknowledge Adam Spangler is here from Congressman Brown's office. So thank you so much for joining us. As you can imagine, our panelists are very tightly scheduled, so we will attempt to answer all questions. But if we can't get to your question on the call, we will circle back with you to make sure you have answers. If you have a question and not submitted it in advance, please feel free to put your question in the chat. I also wanna thank Max Pierce and uh, Luke Tudball who are once again 
working behind the scenes to make me look so much more tech savvy than I truly am. Following tonight's town hall, please feel free to email my office uh, with any questions and we'll get back to you as quickly as possible. And with that, I am honored to introduce Delegate Mary Lehman, District 21, who represents uh, Anne Arundel and Prince George's County and the sponsor of this very, very important legislation on visitation. Welcome, welcome Delegate Lehman. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Delegate Bagnall, and she is a fantastic voice for her district and a great um, productive member of HGO. And I know that from, not because I'm on HGO, but I watch that committee and watch the bills that come out of it. And um, we had quite the discussion on the floor today um, about um, mental health um, services and consent for um, young people for, for uh, young people beginning at age 12 to seek services, but she's a great, a great advocate. Um, so my story about this nursing home visitation bill is actually, uh, my friend Delegate Pena Melnick, who many of you know, um, you know, close, close to mentor to me. I actually worked for her at one time, her first, very first session in the house. Um, she always says that the best bill ideas come from citizens. And I would agree with her on that. In, in this case, this nursing home bill, what ended up being House Bill 983, actually came from my own family's experience. And as Joe D'Amatos knows, my, my friend Joe, who has held our hand, my family's hand since my mother transitioned from an assisted living facility where she was for many, many years, 12 or 14 years at one of the Sunrise facilities um, in assisted living. And essentially she ran out of, um, was starting to run out of money because that, that facility was getting more and more expensive every year and it was out outpacing um, hers and my father's uh, pension. So we had to get her eligible for Medicaid. Um, you know, none of us could take care of her in our homes. And she ended up in a, in a wonderful facility in Montgomery County. Um, Joe knows this facility and he's helped us kind of since day one because it was a little bit of a difficult transition for her from assisted living to skilled nursing. But fast forward to COVID and my oldest sister, Gloria, there are five sisters in the family. And we all live in you know, Montgomery, Prince George's, Anne Arundel. And um, Gloria was actually visiting my mother on, I believe it was March 10th or 11th of 2020 when the staff at this facility came around and told anyone that was visiting, you have about 20 minutes to leave and we're closed indefinitely for visiting because of COVID. So, you know, Gloria visited a little bit, little bit longer and then said her goodbyes, informed all of the rest of us immediately, you know, visits um, are off limits for now. We, they don't know how long it'll be. Um, a year later, a year and a week went by before we were able to see my mother again. In the meantime, we did everything we could to stay connected. We did Zoom visits. We did window visits. And this is a woman prone to clinical depression. Depression runs in my family. She had been hospitalized probably about 20 years ago when my father died for depression. She's very much a people person, very much an extrovert, talks to just about anybody, you know, anyone willing to talk to her, her staff, volunteers, her, um, you know, fellow um, residents. And as she became more isolated and it became a more isolating situation, um, at one point she actually tested positive for COVID. So in May of last year, right before her 88th birthday, she tested positive, never really became symptomatic except fatigue. And, and eventually they did have to give her an IV for dehydration. But other than that, it was a mild case. Um, but she was of course quarantined during that time. And then there was another occasion where her roommate left and came back after being out all day and she ended up in a quarantine situation again. Um, but she definitely, before our eyes, became less and less engaged, um, quieter, you know, she wouldn't many times even like really look at us on Zoom. And Zoom, I think, is overwhelming anyway to elderly people. They don't know where to look. It's sort of, you know, confusing. But even window visit, she was barely engaging with us. Um, and so finally, in the spring of this year, um, earlier in the spring, late winter spring, I guess around February, um, late February, we asked for a psychiatric evaluation of her because we, we could just see her declining before our eyes. And so the psychiatrist at this facility did evaluate her and he came back and said, she is clearly clinically depressed. It's the social isolation, there's no question. 
And by the way, a change in her medication will not be therapeutic. It, it just, we can tell that it won't be. What she needs is visits. She needs someone to engage with her. The staff at this facility, like most facilities, stretched way too thin. They're busy battling COVID. They don't really have time for the things they used to do. And so what he did was basically wrote an order for her for a compassionate care visitor. And the management reached out to us, to the family and said, you know, we cannot provide this for her. However, we have this outside agency that we work with that we can recommend. And uh, my sister, Jean, who is um, in public education and um, works with kids with IEPs, knows a lot of caregiver type people. And she asked the management, she said, what if we found someone on our own as long as she can meet your you know, criteria and I guess be screened. And they said, well, that would be fine. So my family started paying out of pocket because of, of course, Medicaid doesn't cover this kind of thing. And luckily we can do that. It wasn't a hardship, but not everybody can. But we started paying this woman to visit with our mother two to three times a week for an hour to an hour and a half at a time. But that got us to thinking, we said to each other, you know, if she can go visit this person who's not staff of this facility, not related in any way to her mother, has no connection to her. If they would authorize her to come in for compassionate care visits, like, why can't we do that? Like, why, of course, you know, meeting the same like screening and whatever other criteria they would have, uh, we were willing to. And so that led to a conversation between myself and Delegate Pena Melnick, who knows my family. And she said, you know, Mary, I read about a bill that the state of New York is considering that would allow for limited visits, compassionate care visits under certain circumstances, why don't you pursue legislation? And so that was the genesis of this bill and worked with, with Joe and his organization, you know, work with other indus industry folks, work very closely with HGO. And um, so basically this bill does three things. It requires a nursing home to allow visitation by what they call a compassionate care visitor. It restricts that visitor to either the resident's room um, or another designated room. In other words, unlike pre-COVID where you could, you know, go in and sign in and then work, walk, walk through the hallway and get to wherever your, your loved one's room was or a common area, you know, it would be a very specific meeting spot and you'd be limited to that spot. And it would be one person who's designated as the compassionate care visitor. Um, now that visitor can, can be changed if over time that person's not available or they were to become sick or it just is not you know, convenient anymore. So there's an allowance to change the person. And then there would be safety protocols that the, the Department of Health would work with the long-term care industry to come up with the protocols for, with COVID, it could involve testing, it could involve temperature screening, PPE. Um, I know now that we are doing these visits with my mom, like th this facility requires us, requires us to wear two masks. They just feel like, you know, two masks is better than one. And of course we don't question that, but um, you know, that's what the bill does. It's, it, and, and I did get some pushback with some emails of folks that read about it and said, oh, this is terrible. You're gonna further restrict visits. We need the opposite. We need these facilities to open up to loved ones. The social isolation is killing people. And I had to assure people that emailed myself and the whole committee saying this is going to make matters worse. No, this is only when visitation would otherwise not be allowed because of COVID. And at the recommendation of HGO, I actually did come up with language and again, work with Joe and other um, stakeholders to expand the definition because Eventually we'll work through COVID-19, but there could be a COVID-20 or 21. There could be other health emergencies that result in the same kinds of restrictions on visitation. Um, and so we added language beyond COVID-19 to say future health emergencies as declared by the governor under the same health or same public safety article that Governor Hogan, Hogan has been declaring, you know, various restrictions under. And so, you know, I think it turned out to be a great bill. It is pending in the Senate. It did with a lot of handholding from HGO. It passed the committee unanimously with amendments and thanks, great thanks to Joe and some of his colleagues who made great suggestions on how to improve it. And it passed the full house unanimously and Delegate Bagnell can tell you that is not happening very often this session. We, you know, there are just, not a lot of bills passing unanimously. So I hope that bodes well for Senate passage. If for some reason 
this bill does not pass in the Senate, I absolutely will bring it back next year because I don't think this problem is going away. I really don't. Uh, I don't think we'll, we know where we'll be a year from now on COVID, hopefully, you know, beyond where we are now. But again, there could be future um, emergencies where we would be dealing with these kind of restrictions. And I think everyone agrees it's just so devastating for elderly folks. So thank you. I, I think you're absolutely right on that. I mean, it, this is a very forward thinking bill. It's a reaction to what we've just experienced. And I, I think you saw a lot of head nodding from this panel because we, we, we know that we have just been through really what we hope is a once in a lifetime experience. Um, but, but I, I, I'm so appreciative of, of the bill that you put forward and that, that the work of the stakeholders, because I know, I know that, um, I know Mr. D'Amato's worked really hard, you know, sort of hand in glove, but, but there were a lot of people at the table working on this bill. There were actually, for, for, for the folks that, that maybe haven't been watching as, as closely or, or, or are living and breathing H, HGO like I do, um, there were actually several bills um, around this issue that were, um, that, that, that were uh, amalgamated sort of into the into this 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 one piece of legislation um and it really does give us a mechanism going forward that if we have another catastrophic crisis that we have some sort of of um of access point and 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 a path to to visitation so that so that we 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 know how to yeah. um, and, and if i could say one more quick thing and and um you know to credit uh, Delegate Lewis Young, and I don't want to tell her story, but I do know that her mother, for whom this bill is named, passed away late last year. I believe it was December, and, and Delegate Lewis Young shared with me her frustration and stress about not being able to visit her mother, whose illness coincided with COVID and was in a long-term care facility, and she said to me something my family wasn't aware of. She said, you know, I had to use CMS guidelines to basically insist that I be able to see my mother, um, you know, because it was clear she was close to the end of her life. And I don't want anyone else to go through that. And that's, you know, only part of the reason that this bill ended up being named um, for her mom. But, but Delegate Lewis Young also had a, you know, a similar bill. And again, I'm so grateful to her and to Joe and, and others to HGO and the long-term care subcommittee that, you know, that worked to get it right. Um, and, and, uh, you know, I, I, I hope it helps a lot of folks going forward. Thank you. And I really appreciate your, um, your championing this bill and, and your leadership on, on this issue. Um, I want to turn to Ms. Gowan and I apologize that my nerves got the better of me and mispronouncing your name initially. Um, but, but I wanted to turn to you because, you know, we, we were dealing with this right here in Anne Arundel County and, um, and the challenges of guidance coming from the federal level, guidance coming from, from FEMA, from MEMA, from the health department. At one point, I know that um, I had written a, a, a letter just asking for the numbers um, and we were told that, that the numbers were available, but, um, but I went through, I, I actually went through all of the, all of the protocols and all of the guidance around, um, around uh, the numbers and, and identified for the Department of Health that there were, I believe, nine discrepancies in the recommendations. Um, so, so I, I, you know, I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to speak to some of the challenges but also some of the, the, the lessons that we've learned because I, because I know that Anne Arundel County pivoted very quickly um, as, soon as, as soon as we identified that we, that we had uh, outbreaks within the county. Yeah, thank you Delegate Bagnall for having me here tonight and thank you for your advocacy for older adults. Uh, so yes, the pandemic presented many challenges you know, for residents, their family and friends, um, providers of long-term care and their staff at these facilities. Uh, residents were, of course, very isolated due to quarantine and no visitation orders, uh, and guidance um, at times uh, was difficult to communicate to these providers. Staffing shortages uh, due to employees getting COVID or being exposed to COVID through family and friends, uh, you know, having their staff um, have childcare challenges, uh, and leaving the field really due to safety concerns. Uh, I know that staff at many of these facilities were working back-to-back -back hours um, as certain staff were affected by uh, COVID-19. 
Uh, also, the inability for the small assisted livings, um, those are the four to 16 bed facilities to access food and supplies, uh, such as PPE in bulk. Um, the ever-changing federal and state guidelines, uh, uh, having to work with those providers to keep them on the pulse of, of changes and how to implement those. Uh, and there were, you know, complications during outbreaks with these facilities with the ability to quarantine individuals on site uh, and discharge as well as admission of residents. Uh, for perspective, we have in Anne Arundel County, 139 long-term care facilities um, made up of nursing homes, uh, large assisted livings, as Delegate Lehman had mentioned, um, but really our small community-based assisted livings. Those are, again, the four to 16 uh, residents, which make up the largest figure of over 100 of the total uh, 139 long-term care facilities in our county. So to give you perspective, uh, the Department of Aging and Disabilities supports long-term facilities, long-term care facilities uh, in two ways. Uh, so first we have our ombudsman program. Uh, we have ombudsmen that go into these facilities uh, frequently. Uh, they advocate for resident rights, uh, investigate and remedy resident complaints of every type. Also our assisted living housing program. Uh, we monitor the, the small community-based assisted livings and we provide education uh, and support on best care to those, to those facilities. Prior to the pandemic, we were going into all uh, of the facilities in high frequency. Uh, and you know, during the pandemic, it changed the way um, in which these programs function at my department. We needed to quickly move to virtual uh, and telephonic interactions and provide support to these facilities in a different way uh, based on their evolving needs. So some of the challenges that we faced um, in the early onset of the pandemic uh, was the ability to coordinate um, with MEMA um, through our Office of Emergency Management uh, to get uh, immediate PPE to these facilities, especially the small ones that maybe only had five individuals in them uh, and a staff of two. Uh, we've continued then, um, you know, helping the nursing homes and assisted livings with requesting uh, COVID test kits, uh, depart, you know, through the Department of Health, hand sanitizers, wipes, thermometers, and really anything they identified as a need. So the four to 16 uh, bed facilities, the assisted living early in the pandemic had difficulty accessing food in large quantities. Uh, so these, these smaller facilities um, don't purchase through a larger provider like Cisco, maybe um, as some of the Sunrise facilities uh, or you know, the larger nursing homes do. They're very reliant on the grocery store. Um, and as you noticed at the beginning of the pandemic, those shelves were, were pretty bare. Uh, you know, and, and then stores started limiting, um, limiting uh, purchases to one gallon of milk. Well, for a family of four, that might work out. Um, but for maybe 14 individuals, you know, in a home uh, and only able to get out to the grocery store periodically in between providing care, um, this was a challenge. So we did obtain a letter from the Office of County Executive Stuart Pittman, uh, acknowledging and supporting uh, the need for stores to allow these assisted living providers uh, to purchase food and supplies in bulk. Um, so they didn't have to hunt through multiple stores to meet the nutrition needs of residents. Uh, we initiated hundreds of weekly phone calls, um, but as you know, uh, individuals that have challenges with hearing loss uh, or even as we um, had phone calls with residents that were via Zoom, uh, if they had low vision, um, this presented another challenge. We did provide iPads to all the nursing homes through the CARES Act funding, uh, specifically um, to have residents use them, uh, to vi have video visits with family, friends, our ombudsman, uh, and telehealth visits. Uh, we provided them with contact cards uh, with pictures of the ombudsman on them, uh, to every nursing home and assisted living resident uh, to have easy access to advocacy. Uh, we partnered with the health officer to hold informational uh, Zoom meetings for nursing homes and assisted livings uh, to ensure they were understanding those COVID guidelines for infection control, cohorting of residents, uh, and visitation guidelines as those uh, frequently changed. Um, we did partner with the state to ensure that nursing homes were connected to COVID bridge teams. Uh, the Chesapeake Registry of Healthcare Providers 
uh, when needed in order to staff a facility um, due to shortage of employees. And again, for smaller homes where the staffing plan was relatively small, this was a serious need. Uh, we provided uh, technical assistance and obtained answers when the facility staff needed directions, um, interpreting new COVID regulations. A lot of the regulations were set up for the larger providers and communicated to them. Um, but those small mom and pop assisted livings, uh, again, of which we have over 100, um, you know, fell short of that discussion at times. So, you know, we reached out and tried to make sure that they had the right communications. Uh, we provided um, support when nursing homes and assisted livings uh, had large outbreaks, uh, connecting them again with uh, PPE bridge teams. And when we moved into the vaccination phase, we um, assisted the pharmacies, uh, having intimate knowledge with these facilities, uh, we were able to work with CVS and Walgreens. Um, and in contacting the small ALFs again, who don't really use email um, in order to set up uh, vaccination clinics. So we did track all of these facilities and I'm happy to say that all are vaccinated. Um, another challenge uh, that presented itself uh, when discharging um, of residents surfaced. Uh, ombudsman staff um, had to come in and provide some short-term case management, um, you know, potential, uh, you know, monetary assistance while the person was, um, you know, at the long-term care facility and ready to go home. Um, as, as uh, you know, social isolation was a key challenge. Um, you know, we, we collected um, activities, social ideas from facilities uh, and shared um, with others. We coordinated with volunteers to send gift uh, baskets and cards, but really that's no replacement for your family and friends. Uh, you know, to give an example of a, a very small ALF, uh, we had an assisted living um, that only had five residents. The owner was in his seventies. Uh, there were only two other staff and uh, they were all COVID positive and very sick. Um, now at some of these smaller facilities, there's no chef, there's no kitchen, there's no one to deliver the food. Um, you know, they're, they're strictly relying on the person um, that's there to provide care, cook all meals, grocery shop. Um, so we, we really, you know, went to that facility, um, helped them, uh, provided them with food, uh, shopped for them, uh, provided COVID test kits, um, and link them with home uh, health coordination. Uh, so if you've heard, uh, we really had to reimagine how to support these residents uh, while the mandates have been in place. Um, the, these long-term care residents have been greatly missed by our staff. Uh, so now we look forward to getting back into these facilities this month. Uh, I believe my ombudsman are going out um, next week, uh, April 12th. Uh, and we look forward to supporting and advocating for these residents in these facilities. Well, I thank you so much for the work that you do. I, I know that this was incredibly challenging. We were all tested in ways that I don't think any of us ever expected or anticipated. It certainly wasn't in the handbook when I, when I, um, you know, was had my orientation for office. Um, I want to turn to Mr. Demados. I know, I know, I'm going to call you Joe, but I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, you know, be be uh, be a little formal. But, 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 Joe. Um, I, I wanted to turn to you because um, one of the, the big challenges that we've had, and I know that you've, you've been working with us on legislation, but even before COVID, we were looking at ways to, um, to sustain and stabilize the industry because the, you know, the, the margin is, is very close and it, it can sometimes make it inaccessible for families. Um, for, for low-income families uh, to, to, to be able to access these long-term care facilities, assisted living, um, nursing home facilities. And, um, and we really had to reevaluate um, throughout COVID how we were going to make this sustainable when, when we weren't sure what the federal um, what the federal subsidies would look like, what, um, what kind of resiliency would be coming from, from the federal government, what we would have access to at the state level. Um, so if you can speak to, um, you know, what, what we've learned and, 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 and how we can, we can better work to, to stabilize the industry, but also make it really accessible um, because we do have a, a large aging population, which I know is something that, that, that we've been grappling with in HGO for a number of years, even, even before um, we were dealing with the COVID crisis. 
Well, Delegate, Delegate Bagnell, thank you so much for having me here. And uh, Delegate Lehman, thank you for your kind words. And it's good to be amongst uh, friends, uh, partners, and colleagues that um, uh, were friends, partners, and colleagues before COVID-19 have been with us throughout and will be friends after. And Adam, I want to tell you, I, um, I don't often keep lists. I'm not like a list guy, but um, I do have a list of the elected officials that just out of the blue phoned me a year ago when I wasn't shaving every day and I wasn't bathing every day and I was wearing you know, sweats all the time and I was just trying to get PPE to people who couldn't get it. You know, and uh, uh, Congressman uh, Brown was one of those people. And uh, you tell him I appreciate that and I'll forever appreciate that. By the way, the delegates on, 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 on this call were also amongst that group. Let me be explicit about that. You know, as Delegate Lehman says, we've been joined at the hip um, with her mom's journey for a number of years now. And, and, and that's true of a number of different families um, that we work with. And I think it's the best, most rewarding part of my job. Getting to your questions, um, Delegate Bagnell, first, let me say that the 12 years that I've, I've spent at HFAM representing the majority of skilled nursing and rehab centers in Maryland and quite a few assisted livings, uh, the, the decade that I spent at AARP, including as Maryland state director, and the decade I spent in state and local government all sort of informs the answer that I'm sharing with you. Perhaps most importantly, the son of parents who um, were in nursing homes um, and, and a father who died of the flu in a nursing home also informs Sorry. My, 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 my answer, uh, just the traditional flu, you know? So let me just say that a couple of things. Um, first, let me say, pick up exactly where you left off on the question. Uh, COVID-19 uh, shone a bright light on the challenges in nursing homes and assisted living and relative to healthcare disparity and the social determinants of health that pre-exists the pandemic, right? So it shone a bright light on it. Prior, prior to the pandemic, um, independent, private, and government entities um, just on their own, not, not affiliated with, with, with post-acute care, you know, consultancy firms and part of the federal government um, have consistently in, free, in recent years said that um, the non-growth of rates of Medicaid um, have resulted in it being a zero margin or low percentage service. So that means that if you are a nursing home pre-COVID even, the only way you can work towards profitability is to have a mix of higher paying Medicare patients and, medic and being the safety net for Medicaid patients, right? That financially speaking, that's the only thing that's in your control. Um, the other things are in your control are having a quality staff producing a quality product. And there's a whole bunch of other features related to that. So, so leading into the pandemic, workforce and consistent funding were a huge issue. Then, then you go into the pandemic and you know I don't wanna lose sight of one thing because I know you have constituents that are watching this stream, you know, and maybe they haven't, they don't do it for a living the way we all do. The same part of China in which this vaccine sadly began um, is, is, is the part that produces most of the PPE that the United States government imports. So, so let, let's put our arms around that for a second. Um, we needed the federal government in November and December of 2019 to connect the dots that the province in China that sold us most of our gloves and masks weren't producing them because of this virus that we didn't know much about at the time. So by the, by the time that we were all sounding the alarms on COVID-19 um, in early January, you know, HFAM issued our first COVID vaccine on January 29th, um, following the lead of MedKai, 
who the doctors in Maryland that knew this was going to be a big deal. Um, and Tracy and I from the hospital association, you know, we were on the phone together in February, you know, already uh, working very closely with one another. So, you know, this, I'm not saying that we could have avoided as a country, the PPE shortage, but we have to acknowledge that we probably had more advanced notice as a national government um, than people realize. And that the national response in November, December, January, February could have been more aggressive. Um, because you, you know, we we had we had nursing homes, the, the resourced ones, the ones that had staff, right? And and central offices. We had people dedicating two or three full-time employees in February of last year trying to buy PPE at any price anywhere in the world. Um, and, and, you know, which, which Carissa points out very aptly that not everybody could do, uh, either in terms of person power or in terms of dollars, right? Um, the other thing that COVID shone a bright light on is something in terms of infrastructure and then something, again, in terms of who it is that we care for. Um, most of the nursing homes across the country, and they're, they're, they are about 15,000 uh, skilled nursing and rehab centers across the country, about 227 here in Maryland. Most of them are 40 and 50 years old, and they were not physically set up for this kind of crisis, for this type of infectious disease crisis. Not, they're just not built that way. And, um, and connected with that, which again, most people don't realize, is that while it is now a national trend that nursing homes take care of really, really sick people who would otherwise, they're the safety net, who would otherwise be in the hospital, not, not largely at home uh, in Maryland, because residents also have, often have a form of dementia, hypertension, congestive heart failure, maybe diabetes, maybe obesity, all of them together, very, very difficult um, medically and clinically. Um, and so it's shown a bright light on that, on the acuity of people that are in care. And so um, when COVID came around, if you look at the early studies out of New York, the number one factor on a severe case of COVID or from death from it were, um, were people who had hypertension and diabetes uh, and, who were, and who were older. And the majority of people in post-acute long-term care, in nursing homes and in assisted livings in Maryland um, are older, have diabetes yeah. and have hypertension. So let's talk just really quickly for a couple of minutes about the trajectory that got us here. And let's talk about some of, some of the, it's hard to say this about a pandemic that has killed so many people. But let's talk about some of the things that Maryland had going for it. Well, we, one of the things we had going for us were departments like Carissa's in Anne Arundel County. Seriously. Um, it was really important that we had the public health officials um, and they played a really critical role. And all jurisdictions had wins and losses, things we would have done differently just as the sector did, big wins that we were very fortunate for. I'll talk about a big win with Tracy in a moment, but um, but we really needed the team that Carissa has to connect the dots, to connect the dots. Because we still, by the way, have conflicting public policy from the federal government, from CMS and the Center for Disease Control, even now, after a year into the crisis. So how do we navigate that? How do families deal with that? How does Delegate Mary Lehman, the daughter, deal with that, right? So we need, we need places like, we need people like Carissa. That, that's, a, that's an advantage in that every state or every county had across the country when I speak with my colleagues. Um, we had an advantage because of Maryland's unique total cost of care contract with the federal government and how we're paid for hospitals. That was a competitive advantage. I'll give you three reasons. One, because of the total cost of care contract that started as a waiver became the contract, 
and then became the total cost of care contract, because of Maryland's unique agreement with the federal government, we have 400,000 Marylanders that we know that they're assigned to specific physicians through the primary care physician program. Huge advantage. We know those 400,000 people. We know where they live. We know who their doctors are. And we know that they're at risk for things like COVID. Huge advantage. Secondly, because of the work we we're just beginning on the total cost of care contract, we know about our, of our emphasis on diabetes prevention, uh, COVID, I mean, uh, uh, opioid use, mental health challenges, social determinants of health, and healthcare disparities. So while COVID hit, as we were just hitting our stride on that preventive work, we had started, Dr. Chan from MDH, who was in charge of that work pre-COVID, became an integral leader in our fight against COVID. And then two other things that were an advantage to Maryland compared to the rest of the country. Our health exchange system, CRISP, was more seamless in the exchange of data than in other jurisdictions. Now, mind you, it's not perfect. We still don't have, I think, ideal access to the data on the nursing home side on the real-time basis. The fact that we're connected and that physicians and hospitals and nursing homes, when they take a patient at resident, are connected. Um, and while every state has such an exchange, I think ours is more robust and that gave us an advantage. Finally, the fact that I knew Tracy because of our work together or Bob or Bob Atlas from the Hospital Association or, or even the county executive in Anne Arundel County or Cynthia Kelleher in, at UMS or um, uh, Neil uh, at, at LifeBridge, because we all knew each other because of our work, um, our pre-existing partnership saved lives. It saved, it saved lives. If we didn't have that, what happened in New York relative to discharges would have happened here. The difference that, that was the case in Maryland is because of the partnerships that pre-existed and that we could have these tough con conversations. One, one last silver lining and then I want to answer any questions you have about how we help nursing homes navigate it. One more silver lining. Prior to COVID, in Maryland and across the country, we were struggling with the uptake of telemedicine visits. Um, major hospitals in Man Maryland, like Anne Arundel Medical Center, were doing hundreds a month, not thousands. Now, now we're doing hundreds of thousands on the regular basis. Now, they'll never replace total visits. But those augmented with in-person visits will advance healthcare and save lives. So let me hit the pause button and let me reiterate, reiterate one really important point. Um, we are really blessed by the leadership of Delegate Pena Melnick, uh, of, of the chair of, of HGO, of, of, of subcommittee chair Ariana Kelly, of Delegate Lewis Young, of you, Delegate Bagnall, Delegate uh, Lehman, of course, you, my friend and my colleague. And I just want to, you said this before, but I just want to call it out, Delegate Bagnell. Um, there are not a lot of things that happened this session um, unanimously in the General Assembly. Uh, and the fact that this very important visitation bill that we got behind really early, and I support fully, and our sector and even our partners support with the tweaks that we made, it's a testament to both your passion and your leadership, the people on this call. So I'll end there and I'll answer any question about anything that you want, good, bad, or ugly, about where we are and where we're gonna go um, with COVID-19. Thank you. Well, I'm, I think I'm gonna turn to Ms. Laval and then we're gonna circle back on, on questions. And I, I really appreciate that. And I appreciate you highlighting the work of, of our, our chair and our vice chair. Um, Chair Pendergrass and Vice Chair Pena Melnick, because I really do think that um, we are extraordinarily blessed in the state of Maryland um, to to have them at the at the helm, and um, and our 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 Senate partners you know across the street, um, Ms. Laval, I wanted to um, give you an opportunity to, to to speak to your experience, but also to speak to um, something that we haven't really talked about. 
um, you know, Ms. Gowan talked about it, but sort of touched on it. Um, and Mr. D'Amato's talked about the workforce development, but one of, one of the, the big challenges was, was simply the emotional weight of COVID um, on, on these health providers that were, were trying to, to provide care um, in really uh, challenging circumstances. Uh, and I know that, you know, we've learned lessons about telehealth. In fact, I, you know, I, I have, have put in a bill that was amended into the telehealth bill um, around behavioral health because we realized that, that it was an incredibly uh, meaningful and powerful delivery method. Um, we know that we have to address the digital divide because even though we had this as a resource, it was not accessible to everyone. We have equity, um, you know, equity and healthcare bills that are in to address the concerns that um, that, that that Joe brought up about, um, you know, about that 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 equity gap in in services. But we really haven't talked about the the emotional impact of COVID on these health providers. Um, and so I wanted to, 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 to ask you to speak to that and also to what resources we've, we've provided to our, our, our providers, because I often ask that question, who are the caregivers for the caregivers? Yeah, sure. That's a great, um, and, and huge topic and really important topic. Um, and we saw when, when this first started, and I think everyone has alluded to it a bit um, in their comments is that as, as we started to see this tidal wave coming at us, we knew that this was nothing like we had ever seen before. And um, it, it, the, the heightened state of alert and the, the 14, 16, 18 hour days that everyone was putting in and we, it was, was just, unbelievable. Um, and staffing is always an issue in hospitals, in post-acute facilities. It's always an issue. We, we need more at every level. Community health workers, peer, uh, peer supports, physicians, mid-level, uh, the whole gamut, we need more. And we need more in behavioral health too. Um, there, there aren't enough behavioral health providers to um, to give care to everyone who needs it. Um, it's, it's a, a, it was an issue before COVID came and as the crisis that we were all under um, just magnified those needs. Um, so what we did see was um, the Behavioral Health Administration really stepped up and, and we were with the hospital association, we're in close contact with them to um, identify what the needs were and what, what things we could uh, put in place relatively quickly to begin to care for the caregiver. Um, we also worked with them to put in place and to figure out, okay, when, when we deliver behavioral health care in an institutional setting, whether that's a hospital or a, some other inpatient facility or, or an outpatient facility, you bring people together and, and you talk in a group. Well, how do you do that when you're socially distanced? And the CDC guidelines were not not speaking to any of that. So um, I think it was, you know, another really good example of how people came together. If you didn't know somebody's phone number, you learned it pretty quickly. Um, and you, you got on the phone and started to figure all of this stuff out. And, and that was just, that was really important. So, so those things were put in place. That was for patients, um, for the caregivers, um, just trying to figure out what, what do folks need? Whether I think early on, it was just um, the, the thank yous or um, bringing in lunch or the appreciation, the trying to do everything possible. Can we get, um, you know, the state and, and others came together to set up um, childcare for workers at hospitals um, because they needed somewhere to take their kids because they weren't in schools. And then Transit, of course, had to close down because they were limiting the spread, but that's how a lot of people got to work was on public transit. So could we had to work together with folks in the um, transit, um, I don't know their name exactly, but <laughs> to, to find out which routes do we need to put in place at what times. And now what we see 
um, as we got a little bit further through that was that um, different organizations brought in experts to set up um, caring for the caregiver program. So there's a lot, there's um, networks um, that I know of through the hospital association and through other state associations um, that are um, it's a webinar and then links to other resources, links to um, um, people that you can raise issues to. And those have been, those have been helpful. There's still, I'm not trying to say at all that we're on the other side of that because now these caregivers who went into healthcare because they felt something in their heart to take care of people, um, they've given and given and given and they're tired and they're, they're really tired. And um, someone, I think it was Ms. Gowan um, mentioned the um, staffing agencies and Chesapeake Registry and that was really important. Um, but now it's across the country where we're trying, everyone is looking for more staff. Um, so it's not just a local, a local issue. So we're not quite on the other side of that yet. Um, you know, as we think about what might be coming in the future, we may have, you know, uh, additional cases coming. We're watching those case counts in hospitals to make sure that we have the acute care ability to um, take care of patients who need to be in the hospital. Um, and it's not bed space that is lacking, it's the people power to be able to um, take care of everyone right now. So that's, it's been a challenge. We're not quite through that yet, um, but, but that's, the, that's what's out there. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. You know, as we tee up the continuing conversation, um, and I appreciate everything that you've offered, Tracy, I just wanted to be explicit as we're ending this session, we have county government here. We're at a unique point in the pandemic um, that we're still fighting and that we'll be fighting for a long time. I guess I wanted to be explicit about teeing up a couple of observations real quick. So we started with the COVID-19 pandemic, which is the topic of this call and what we've all been navigating over the last year and a plus. We started during the COVID pandemic, um, which Delegate Lehman and Delegate Lewis Young have so articulately explained to us. Or in the middle part of the COVID pandemic, we began a social isolation pandemic that continues. So we have a, a COVID pandemic that continues with ups and downs. We are, we are now in an isolation pandemic where we were last spring in the COVID pandemic. It's really hot and heavy and challenging. And then going forward, even as we improve those things, we are going to have a mental health crisis. It's a fact. Um, and, and I know county governments specifically are looking at this but it will, it will be widespread. It'll be kids dealing with the social isolation of missing school and activities. It'll be the people that we're speaking about on this call that are patients, residents, or family members. It will be the caregivers um, as well. And, and so that, that will be then another pandemic that is just now sadly beginning. And I think if we call it out, um, we'll work together and we'll navigate it as effectively as we can. Also knowing that we still have the workforce issues and the funding issues and, and so forth. But COVID pandemic is continuing, different now, better now, but continuing. Isolation pandemic, hot and heavy. Sadly, mental health pandemics soon to come. Well, thank you for that. And, and, um, and I, I feel at this point that we share a brain um, because that was very much um, where, where, where my thinking is. And in fact, um, because of, of, of the nature of, of working in an industry that prior to, to being in office in an industry that's always in flux, very early on in the pandemic, my first questions were, what's on the back end of this? Um, and I actually brought that up, um, that we were going to see a financial crisis and then a health, a mental health crisis, um, you know, resulting in this. But of course, at the, at the time, 
the, the health department was, they were, they were tasked with keeping people alive. And we knew that we would have to address this um, further down the line. Um, but but that's, a, that's a really good segue to, to what I wanted to talk about, which is, uh, first of all, I wanna say thank you, Ms. Laval, um, for, 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 for you know, articulating that, 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 that challenge and, and the, the work that you, that you did do in support of those caregivers. But we know that um, we now have um, an elder population that has this, this additional trauma in isolation um, and, and a youth population that has a trauma that we have never had to deal with. So we don't really have information on what that looks like. And then of course, we've got everyone in between. So, um, and, and all of you have been in my committee at some point, the rules to what my committee do not apply in this town hall. It's not one question, one answer. Um, so feel free to, to, to weigh in. This is a conversation. Um, um, but, but I wanted, I wanted to, to uh, bring a couple questions forward that have already been introduced. One of which, um, came from one of our constituents and they were asking about um, how we deal with the long-term physical impact of COVID in our, in our long-term care facilities and our nursing homes and our assisted living facilities, not just the long haulers, but, but, but um, as we identify going forward, what the, the, the underlying impacts of COVID are, you know, the impacts on, on, on lungs, the impacts on, on other organs, um, because I don't think we even know yet. Um, and how, how, do we, how do we ensure that we have care for those populations as we identify um, the long-term effects of COVID? Well, I, I suspect, I'll just do a real quick one. I, from all the research the physicians are sharing with us right now, I suspect that the, the syndromes, the clinical syndromes, or the clinical consequences of COVID um, will be yet another sort of group of chronic illnesses that sadly, across the whole continuum of care, that we're going to have to deal with, not just in nursing homes and assisted livings, but in pediatricians' offices and doctors' offices. I was on a call with national leaders, government leaders yesterday, day before, they all blend together. And they're, they're, they're leader, colleague leaders in government that are talking about navigating this over the next decade. You know, not to be, you know, a downer about it, but it's better to acknowledge that we're going to we're going to be figuring stuff out for a while on this. So I suspect these illnesses and syndromes will be something that we manage from pediatrician to geriatrician for the coming years. Tracy, I saw that you wanted to speak. Yeah, I'll just um, I'll add to that um, to to that good answer that that you're um, giving is that um, one piece of this that's going to be important is to continue um, rehabilitation. And, and that's what happens in post-acute facilities. Once, once someone's over an acute phase, um, the post-acute facilities are really a great place for rehabilitation. And whether that's you know at, with home care and at home or in assisted living or skilled nursing, um, because one of the early things that we heard, you know, as soon as we started seeing cases here in Maryland and we're trying to figure out how to plan, um, you know, we were on, on calls with our colleagues in California and Washington um, who were seeing cases early and physicians were saying, oh, you know, my, my colleague is in London. Let me call them because they've had some cases already and see what are they seeing, you know, a month, two months out. And, and one of the early things that we heard was how important um, the rehab was, um, rehabilitation, physical, occupational therapy and such. Um, afterwards. And I think those needs will go on and continue and we'll learn more about them um, as we see. Thank you. And, and I'm going to ask um, a follow-up that's, you know, it's, it is a bit controversial, but I think it is uh, kind of the elephant in the room. Um, and it was asked by, by the, the, uh, a constituent, how do we rest back 
this narrative um, that 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 we've been grappling with for a year, um, where a large part of our population essentially identified our elder population as expendable. How do we rest that back? How do we change that so that our, our elder population don't feel like they are expendable? And I, I don't know if you have an answer. I don't have an answer to that. Yeah, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just chime in because maybe I'm the only guy here that can claim to have, uh, that was grew up in Hawaii, that was the AARP state director in Maryland and who now represents nursing homes. Um, so first the growing up in Hawaii part, right? Um, and I think something that we all agree with here or we wouldn't be doing the work that we do. Like Carissa would not be doing the job that she did or Tracy or any of us, uh, our elected leaders, if we didn't value um, our kapuna, our people that are older than us, right? Lang word for that in, in Olelo Hawaii and native Hawaiian is kapuna. And you, know, you, you grow up, thinking of kapuna ali'i, that kapunas are really, they're really regal, they're to be treasured. And the reality is, is that pre-COVID, um, we don't in this country, and it's, it's true of like where I'm talking to you right now, we don't in this country, uh, over a period of years, invest in enough public health dollars over the last 25 or 30 years to care for somebody when they're in their 40s, 50s, and 60s so that they aren't at the risk that they are in their 70s and 80s. You know, people ask me all the time, how do we, um, how do we get less people in nursing homes? And, and I say, well, first, if a nursing home is the best place for you to be in terms of your clinical needs and your safety or your rehab, then you should be there, right? But if in terms of your rehab and your clinical needs and your safety, that you can be somewhere else, you should be somewhere else. But in many respects, this problem that your constituent brings up so eloquently is the fact, it's, it's sort of like, it's not that all elders are expendable, it's, 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 it's or all kapuna are expendable, it's that, we're not acknowledging that individual responsibility, government policy, food deserts, transportation, they all play a role in people being healthy as they age. And, um, and you know, so in terms of like the more explicit answer, all of us on the Zoom, we just have to call it out. We have to just literally say, we honor and value our elders. You know, I, I, before COVID, I was in a nursing home on average once every two weeks. It's the biggest thing I miss. And I will tell you this, most of the people in assisted living and in nursing homes, they have some form of dementia. But, but let, me say, let me say this very importantly. It's been very seldom that I've visited one of these places with somebody who really is struggling with their reality, where I haven't made a deep connection with that person struggling with their reality. Uh, and that's just a statement to say that um, all of these folks are treasures. We need to keep talking about them being treasures and we need to meet them where they are, meet them where they are, wherever they are and value them wherever they are. So it's just gonna take all of us calling that out and, and working hard, you know, Delegate Lehman, you know, you're my friend. We've had a lot of discussions just for the heck of it. Can I draw you in just because I know we've had talks about this. What would you add about th to that? To your, to your point about, to your answer to, to Delegate Bagnell's question about people being sort of, ex he's muted now. I was, yeah, I was listening to your answer. I, uh, you know, I hope that, um, you know, maybe if there's, there, there have to be, at least in the worst of situations, I think Delegate Bagnell, and I think most people would agree that somehow we, we can usually find a silver lining and, um, you know, may, maybe for one thing, the, the isolation that already did exist for some folks in 
long-term care facilities has, you know, this has shown a bright light on that because, you know, let's be honest, another sort of elephant in the room when you talk about, you know, any type of residential facility. And I know my two oldest sisters back in the day worked at a facility in Prince George's County called Great Oaks. It was closed years ago, but it was for developmentally disabled people. And they, my parents allowed them to sometimes bring residents home with them. They had to get permission from, you know, the management, but there were people put into, you know, these homes and, and I'm, I'm sure it's true of nursing homes as well that never get visitors. They never have, you know, anyone once they're there, you know, in some cases it might be that there aren't many family left, that this person has outlived a spouse, maybe their adult children or grandchildren are sort of far flung. Um, but I think I think staff of these facilities would tell you they know who there doesn't get visitors um, that they may or may not you know always have as much time as they want to interact with these residents. They certainly have not had that opportunity during COVID because of all of the challenges. As as I think Delegate Bagno said, they they were their number one job was keeping people alive. Um, so there's there's no easy answer, but. I think um, that that clearly, you know, within you know um, you know boundaries, it's a balancing act um, with a with an uh, pandemic like this. Isolation is not the answer. Further isolation is, you know, it's just soul crushing. It would be for any of us, for people much younger, but never mind people, you know, at the end of their lives that that know they don't have much time left and. Um, you know, I, I hope that whether it's through, I think it'll be a combination of things. It can't just, you know, my, my, my bill, uh, even if it passes, is not the only answer. I think that, um, you know, when, when there's more light um, at the end of this tunnel, that that's the kind of thing, um, you know, Joe and others in this industry should be working with, you know, facilities on. Um, you know, how can we do better going forward, not just during a pandemic, but, um, you know, to to have more, um, you know, social and other interactions. Because the, the other thing I didn't mention when I was describing sort of the lead up to my bill um, that my my mother and, and, and no doubt most others were missing out on is virtually all of the activities were canceled. So not only were there not visits, from loved ones, from whoever else would, you know, outside groups, students, uh, church, you know, leaders and church groups and, and, you know, entertainers, people that would come in and do sing-alongs. There was none of that going on either um, because again, I, I assume part of it was that staff were stretched so thin, but the other part was, well, you know, even when you're doing things like playing bingo or doing chair exercise, you're probably worried about people's proximity to each other. And, you know, there are other challenges in, in dealing with, you know, elderly folks, especially very elderly folks with like someone mentioned, a lot of them are hard of hearing. And, um, you know, but, but my sisters and I kept asking, can you figure out a way to do something with them, even if they're further apart when they do it or, or, or something that gives them something to look forward to? Because my mother had nothing to look forward to anymore. Nothing. And I don't think as, as Delegate Bagnell suggested, and, and similar with, with you know, school age kids, I don't think we're going to know for a long time the full extent of the effect of, of the, um, you know, mental health and, and emotional effects that this is this has had and will continue to have on people. We just have to be mindful of that and do better. I, I think that's absolutely true. And I think that's a great place to, to um we have another question, but be mindful and do better. And I think that we have, um, you know, we have a, a, an opportunity now to, to take a breath, even though we're still in the midst of this, we're through the, 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 I think the scariest part of the first, you know, the first crisis. Um, and we're able to take a breath and evaluate what worked, what didn't work, what have we learned, what can we do better? Um, and, and COVID forced us to be really creative. It forced us to break out of, uh, out of the mold of, of, of doing things because that's the way we've always done them. Um, and so I, I really appreciate everyone on this call speaking to the, 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 
the way that that you have pivoted during this crisis. And I I I want you to know that I I just applaud your efforts and 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 you being here to to highlight um, this issue. And and I know that um, my 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 partner in all things had a question for you. So I'm going to turn it over to him. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, in asking this question, actually, I should uh, I should acknowledge the person who the, who asked the question originally, which is Mr. Carl Camiro from the Alzheimer's Association. Um, first, a question for yourself, Joe. Uh, can you please just sort of share some brief thoughts about the uh, CBS Walgreens, uh, you know, vaccinations that uh, went into nursing homes? Uh, you know, what was one of the things that went well about that? And were there things that, uh, you know, could have been improved? No, that's a great question. Thank you for that from you and from the constituent. Um, so I was actually at the first CVS Walgreens clinic on December 23rd in uh, Baltimore County. They were, they were uh, a handful of those clinics on December 23rd. And they were amazing to be at, to just look at the joy in people's faces. I mean, they really were little vials of hope being injected into people's arms. Um, it was incredible. I think all in all, um, the CVS Walgreens uh, national contracts uh, to vaccinate people uh, in nursing homes and in assisted living were a net net, probably A minus grade win with some bumps along the way. So some of the bumps along the ways, people may not realize um, that even though it was a federal contract and a federal program, that the state of Maryland needed to allocate the vaccine to the federal program. So that's a step most people, most constituents don't realize. And there was a shortage of vaccine just in general. And again, one of, one of the things I think the Hogan administration did well is allocating vaccine initially to the hospitals. They got it first and then to this national program. But a couple of the bumps. Um, initially, it was only assisted livings that were attached to nursing homes that were gonna be vaccinated, right? So that meant if you were associated with a nursing home on this side of the street, you probably were gonna get scheduled, but if you were across the street and an assisted living, you weren't gonna be scheduled. That was a problem. And we really did encounter that in Montgomery County, like quite literally. Um, so that was a challenge that we had to work with the state to overcome. We eventually added all assisted livings. But then it became very problematic to identify smaller assisted livings because, quite frankly, the federal government has much less information on assisted livings that are regulated by state and local governments than they are the federal government. So then all of a sudden, you know, we have a list of 600 nursing homes provided by the federal government to CVS and Walgreens with nothing but a name, no address, no phone number, no email, no nothing, you know? So then you're working with local agencies uh, and, and the state, you know, trying to fill in the blanks um, while you're only dealing with two vaccines that have to be given a couple, three weeks apart. So that, 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 was, that was a challenge. Again, though, I think all in all, it was a success. Finally, another, another challenge was that um, the federal government left it to states on, on whether a state would allow a second dose to be delivered on the third clinic um, at a nursing home or assisted living. So the federal government contracted CVS Walgreens to do three clinics. So the federal government said, it's up to you states on how you wanna handle that. Well, states were a little skeptical about that, some states, right? Because if you're gonna give somebody a first dose on a third clinic, and then there's no fourth clinic scheduled, how do you get them their second dose? Well, the application of that in Maryland varied tremendously. So about a month ago, we identified about 1500 people in nursing homes in Maryland that got the first dose but had no way of possibly getting the second. So we had to work with the state and resolve that, you know, and resolve that. And, and thankfully, there were good partners on that. But so all in all, I think that was an A, A minus program. The problem that we have now is that 
um, we still have short supply relative to the ongoing needs. So while 90% of the residents in nursing homes and in the larger assisted livings were vaccinated, let's say as of a month ago, people get discharged, they go home, people go to the hospital, they enter the nursing home. So now we probably only have about 75 or 80% of the residents vaccinated um, because we got new people there. And so that's a challenge that we're currently working on with the state to do an interim program and, 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 and working on almost daily on them with that. So that's Thank probably you. way more of an answer, Luke, than you wanted, but that's an inside scoop of vaccines in nursing homes. <laughs> Well, actually, there was a follow-up to that, actually, and you had a perfect segue, so thank you for that, uh, which is, uh, Ms. Laval, um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the steps that uh, that you all took, you know, during the pandemic to facilitate safe transfers between, you know, nursing homes and hospitals and vice versa? Sure. That, that was, um, you know, transferring patients between nursing homes and other post-acute facilities and hospitals was a huge, um, a huge piece of what we had to do early on. Probably the first thing that, that uh, Joe, you and I had to, to really talk about what to do here, um, because this was, you know, um, just to go back a little bit, um, when the virus was circulating in the community and and some people were sick, but others weren't and passing this virus along and we didn't yet have test kits. Um, so we didn't know who had it. Um, we didn't know that the virus was getting into the post-acute facilities. A lot of the uh, folks who were there, um, it, it's kind of a conundrum really, to, it's, it's odd that um, a lot of the folks who had the virus did not have any symptoms didn't really feel sick at all. Maybe, and when they had a fever, it was a very low fever compared to, um, you know, other folks who were walking around um, outside of a facility. Um, so, so the virus was circulating in, in the post-acute facilities and, and we didn't know that. Um, and then all of a sudden, there would be a lot of people who were very sick and, you know, the, the very definition of a post-acute facility is for people who are not acutely ill. So they're people who are medically stable. They just need uh, some extra help or need some uh, rehabilitation or um, a little bit of uh, medical care. Um, so to all of a sudden have a lot of people really sick was a very big challenge. And, um, you know, one approach was to have everybody go to the emergency department was, and that didn't work out all that well because then the emergency department has all of these people who maybe are not quite ill enough to be at the hospital when it's already full. Um, so that, that was the picture that we were working with there. So this is when um, the partnerships that hospitals and post-acute facilities already had in place, even, even before COVID began, um, this um, coordinating and smoothing and uh, communicating as people are either discharged from a hospital to a post-acute facility, or when they're at the post-acute facility and need to come to the hospital, that communication is key. Um, so, so folks have, that work had started already. It ramped way up um, during, um, during the COVID times. Um, and, and we've been continuing to build on that now. I think a couple of things that have been especially helpful. Um, one is um, implementing telehealth. So um, that's been very helpful because you might have a person who is at a post-acute facility. The uh, person taking care of them says, you know, they don't look right. Something's not quite right, but, but they, they, they need maybe a, a pulmonologist or a cardiologist and, and the nursing home typically doesn't have a cardiologist on site. That's not what they do. So with some telehealth can get a consult, um, maybe change up the medications or, or you know, make some tweaks and the person can be taken care of in place. That, that's a huge help. Um, I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir on that one. <laughs> um, you all know that. Um, so that's a big help. The other thing during the crisis time that was very helpful was the medical assistance team, where um, 
a, a nursing home could say, you know, they could raise their hand and say, look, we're, this is, this is beyond what we can, can manage. Um, either call the local health officer um, at the county or call the hospital that we're partnered with and say, we need a team of people to come over and help, help get us situated again. That was also um, a very helpful thing to do. Um, so that th those two um, activities will continue and have continued. The third thing that has continued is the partnerships between specific nursing homes and specific hospitals. And they partner up based on, um, you know, mostly the shared patients and shared referral patterns. And that communication is better than it was before. It was something that we continue to work on, just like we work on our relationships with our family and friends all the time. So um, we're continuing to work on those areas, but it's, this is one of, if we have a silver lining, those are some of the silver linings that I see. Thank you so much, Ms. Laval. And first of all, I don't want you to ever be, you know, feel like you're preaching to the choir because we all live and breathe this stuff. But, but the fact is people who are watching um, have been living on, on, on very, um, uh, very alarming headlines for a year. So really being able to sort of dig deep into what we're doing here in the county and the state, I think, I think it's reassuring. And it's also the reason that we're doing these town halls is, is so that we can inform the public of, of, of what we're doing because in the midst of a crisis, we don't have that luxury. Normally we try to be much more, you know, informing and, and educating the population on what we're doing. But when, when we are, addressing life and death situations, we don't have the spokespeople out in front. So I, I, I appreciate you being here to give us that opportunity to, to sort of present what, what's been happening behind closed doors, literally behind closed doors. Um, I wanted to turn to a, to a question that's, that's in the chat. And, and actually I'm gonna start uh, Ms. Gowan with you um, to talk about what we're doing at the county level as a policy, and then we can open it up from there. But um, if you could talk about the challenges of vaccinating staff in the long-term care facilities. Um, I understand that the, you know, we, we, we don't mandate um, vaccinations. Um, do, we, do we have a program of incentivizing vaccinations? Um, what is the main barrier or challenge to, to vaccinating staff? And, and where are we on, on um, staff vaccinations? We don't currently have a policy on mandating anyone uh, to become vaccinated, um, and I'm not sure if that will change anytime soon. Um, we have been doing um, outreach and education, uh, you know, for the general population as well as uh, communities, um, you know, where there has been, you know, some health disparities. Um, so we've been uh, actively educating. And I think that now that we're on more of a roll and receiving more vaccination, uh, I think that we'll be able to turn our efforts more towards, um, you know, outreach and education for these populations um, that, that may have hesitancy towards vaccinations. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that because I know the challenge, even, even the word mandate is, 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 um, problematic. Uh, the, the, the minute that you raise it, all of the, the alarms um, and the fear that was already surrounding the vaccine are just, are, they're just, they're just um, you know, magnified. Mm -hmm. And I think I'll, I'll add to that a couple of pieces, um, you know, on the vaccines. They're under an emergency use authorization. They've gone through all the steps in the process to um, receive that um, FDA authorization, um, but because it was so quick, I think there is an interest in seeing, um, one, what COVID is going to do, as we talked about, what does long COVID look like, or what do the, the end results of COVID look like, someone who has had it and recovered, what, does, what might happen with them in a couple of years? I think we, there's also an interest in seeing a couple of years down the road, um, we don't expect anything coming from the vaccines other than being helpful, but let's see that a couple of years down the road. Um, there'll be a process in a few years where there is, I just call it kind of regular authorization rather than emergency use authorization. Um, so I think we, at the very least, we need to wait for that 
Um, and to the, the issue of um, hesitancy around vaccines and acceptance, um, you know, we're seeing people from uh, different groups have different reasons for being hesitant. Um, you know, a longstanding history of racism, other concerns about um, how, how the pandemic has been spoken about um, have contributed to this hesitancy. Um, and what we're seeing as, as, um, as our hospital um, and the hospital association has puts out resources and ways to um, talk with people is that it's not a big flashy campaign that changes someone's mind. It's a it's a one-on-one -on -one or a small group conversation. And so we see people who move from, no, I don't think I, I want that ever, don't really want to talk about it to, well, maybe, or, you know, my daughter asked me to get this vaccine so that I could see the grandkids again. You know, it's, it's everybody has their own personal reason for, for changing their mind um, or, or potentially moving. And, and I think we have to honor that and um, it, it will take some time to, to continue to work through that. And I think that's a great point because because we're, we're, we're not doing big flashy marketing because there there is um, there is a challenge with trust. There is a challenge with with systemic um, uh, bias within our healthcare system, which we you know we talked about earlier. We we, we are constantly working on um, on uh, on the challenges of, of health disparities, but also of of a historic abuse in our healthcare system, which is. It's it's very real, and the the concern is very real, um, and I think it is that we are challenged with with navigating that um, you know finding that balance between how we reach herd immunity, how we ensure that 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 the people who are are um, in, you know in healthcare are also safe. Operating in in those spheres and and keeping keeping the people that that um, that they serve safe, um, and also not um, contributing to that fear. So I, I appreciate um, I appreciate the challenge of of that of that balancing act, and um, and and your your efforts in um, in assuring our communities about about the safety and efficacy of the vaccine and I know that we still you know we're still learning we we, we are possibly looking at um, at boosters and and, and, and variants and, and all of that is um, is sort of this constantly changing landscape I know that we are coming up on time so I want to 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 honor and but also give you an opportunity um, to make final remarks um, and, and I do also want to thank our health officer here in Anne Arundel County. I know um, Ms. Gowan talked a little bit about the importance of the health officer. Um, Dr. Kaliana Raman has been uh, incredibly generous with my office on information uh, all throughout the pandemic. So I did want to take a moment to, to just acknowledge our, our, our county health department as well as the state health department and, um, and, and give you all an opportunity to um, to, to have final comments on, on you know, where we go from here. Because I think, I, think, I, I think we do have um, a lot of silver linings that have been identified tonight on this call. Let me start with, um, with let me start with Joe. <laughs> final thoughts, Mr. Well, Donato. One quick final thought. Uh, uh, first, thank you, Delegate Bagnell, for bringing us all together and for all that you do. Delegate Lehman, thank you so much for the, what you do. And Carissa, you, you, you know, we need to highlight you all because not everything's created equal and you made a really big difference. I just hope you take care of yourself because we still need you. Don't think that we don't need you anymore. Take care of yourself. Uh, one, one quick thing about where we are and where we're going to, where we're going to go. Uh, picking up on the hesitancy thing, our, the number one most important thing. Um, so I understand hesitancy. I've been interviewed on hesitancy, uh, Delegate Bagnell, you nailed it with regard to real historic systemic bias in our system that we're up against. Um, and, and I won't go more into that. I, I, I will say a couple of things. Hesitancy is different in Western Maryland, on the Eastern shore, in Prince George's County, 
in Baltimore City and in Anne Arundel County. It's not one type of hesitance. And, and, and I think it's all legitimate and we need to meet people where they are. Um, and I think it's about peer to peer. Now, the good news about hesitance is that it's getting better. Uh, and I think that's what I would say about hesitance. In general, I would say that the number one thing that any of us can do um, to get back to some sense of normalcy is to take the vaccine when it's our turn to take the vaccine. Um, and that's gonna be very important. And I wanted to just end real quick on this for my part, uh, Delegate Bagnell, because I want your constituents to know this. I actually met you days after you were elected at the Maggie McIntosh fundraising event. And you know you hadn't you hadn't even gotten committee assignments yet. I think they happened that night or the next day. And one of the things that I knew about you and knew you were a keeper on just that one night was you ask really good questions. You know the mark of a great legislator is not having the answers. It's knowing the questions to ask. And it's like Delegate Lehman says and Delegate Pena Melnick says it's about the best bills coming from personal experience in the community. So I just want your constituents to hear that. Um, true story, and I really appreciate you. Thank you, thank you, I really appreciate that. I'm, I'm a little speechless. I'm gonna turn it over to, to the panel. Well, thank you, uh, Delegate Bagnell, for having me tonight. Um, in closing, just to look at um, talking about the new normal. Uh, you know, during the pandemic, uh, my staff have found unique ways to serve older adults new ways to, to serve older adults. Uh, and we found individuals who are underserved, who we didn't find this entire time until now. Um, so I, I don't know that we'll be going back to the new normal uh, because I think we found a better approach to serving older adults in our county. Uh, I also wanna highlight next month is Older Americans Month. Uh, and this year's theme is communities of strength, uh, talking about the resiliency of this population. Um, so thank you for having me tonight. Thank you so much. Um, so I'll just um, echo some of these comments and say thank you for bringing us together, Delegate Bagnall. Um, it's great to have a conversation. It's great to have an opportunity to share some of the stories of what has gone on behind the scenes because it is as difficult and challenging as this year has been and we're not all the way through it yet, um, there really are some really good stories of how um, everyone that has, has just stepped up to the plate um, and, and done all that they can do and gone far above and beyond to um, try to keep people safe and healthy and um, do the best we can. And, and I'm, I'm proud of what we've done um, locally and, and in the state. It's been really amazing. So thank you. Thank you for all your work. Delegate Lehman, I'm gonna give you final comments. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you Thank for you. all of your advocacy. Thank you, Delegate Bagnell. Thank you. That's a, that's a great honor coming from you. I would just say this is my third session in Annapolis. I got elected at the same time as Delegate Bagnell, my first foray into doing healthcare legislation. So first experience with HGO, and it could not have been more satisfying. I was I told Delegate uh, Chair Pendergrass one day when she was leaving the House floor just ahead of me, I said, I was so floored to be invited by the long-term care subcommittee to come back after the full committee hearing and participate in a further discussion of my bill and you know what, what you know, lingering questions there might be, what uh, possibilities there were for amendments. And I was like, wait a minute, you want me to come? And it, like that is, as far as I know, in my limited experience in Annapolis, a very unusual practice and, and very, very helpful, very welcome. You know, after I got over my shock, it was, it was really useful and empowering actually to be, you know, on a subcommittee meeting with the whole group, with the leadership of um, uh, Delegate uh, Chair um, Kelly and um, uh, Delegate Cullison chiming in and you know, supporting the idea of broadening the bill to go beyond COVID and include future health emergencies. It was just so satisfying. Um, you know, I, I look forward to bringing more health bills in the future <laughs> because it really and truly, it is how I think 
uh, respectfully of the other committees. I think every committee should work this way. And um, it's just been a bright spot for me, really and truly. So as I said, if for some reason this bill does not go forward in the Senate, I will be back next year with it because this is not the end, as many of you have said, of, of this you know, of this challenge, not only just not not just for COVID, but for other, um, you know, health emergencies in the future. So thank you to everyone for all of the hand holding holding um, and Delegate Bagnell, you were certainly part of that. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, Delegate Lehman. And I just want to thank everyone on this call tonight. Obviously, this is not the end of the conversation. It's just the beginning. And I, I, I think the fact that we're we're already past 830 speaks to to how 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 much um, work has been done and how much work there is to do. And I appreciate that you all continue to be um, valid partners in 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 trying to um, to resolve, you know, how how we address um, health disparities and long term care and COVID. I I want to thank once again Congressman Brown's office for being on this call and for being a constant partner as, as we navigate this. Um, and I'm, I'm going to turn this over to my partner now. Um, for some, some final time. comments and to, uh, to tell you about our upcoming events. But thank you once again to everyone on this call, our panelists and, and, our, um, and our audience. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. I, I won't take too much of your time. I know that we're all here a few extra minutes already, and every minute is precious during session. So um, thank you to uh, all of the panelists, of course, and, and, I, and I would be re remiss of me if I did not thank, of course, Delegate Bag now, who will never thank herself, uh, but she deserves it. And um, so thank you, De Delegate Bag now, uh, for all that you do, but especially hosting this series, so, which also is not at the end, uh, although this particular one is at an end. Uh, we have two more virtual town halls coming up, um, one which will be focused on, on veterans issues, uh, so please join us for that, and one which um, will be um, possibly a little more contentious, which is going to be about police reform, um, but keep an eye on the social uh, media, and um, and if you want to sign up to our e-blasts, uh, please go on heatherbagnell.com, there's a little um, tab on there that says subscribe, and that way you'll stay in the loop and make sure we'll keep you informed of everything that is happening, um, even after the end of session, you know, going forward in the interim, uh, we're always uh, doing uh, open offices and sorts of things like that. So uh, if you do have any questions that we did not get to during the town hall, of course, please do email uh, the office at heather.bagnall at house.state.md.us, and that's in the chat as well. Uh, and other than that, we do really appreciate everybody's time and everybody's energy and everybody's support. So please do keep safe, stay well, and uh, we'll see you next time.